Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. As Campaign 2000 gathers steam, the cry for campaign finance reform grows loud and louder. Pundits and voters complain that we have the best government money can buy, that corporate fat cats and union bosses run the system, that the government is paralyzed, that legislation is sold to the highest bidder. One politician bragged, I can't be bought, I can be rented. But what kind of reforms, if any, are needed? Some say there is too much money in politics. Others argue there is not enough money in politics. And some say the whole problem is overrated and overstated. Joining Think Tank to take a look at the role of money in campaigns are Lamar Alexander, former governor of Tennessee, secretary of education, and Republican presidential contender. Thomas Mann, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and co-author of Campaign Finance Reform, a source book, and Nancy Northup, adjunct professor at New York University Law School and director of the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. The topic before the House, campaign finance, are dollars despoiling democracy? This week on Think Tank. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. In the wake of the Watergate scandal, Congress revisited the American campaign finance system and passed the Federal Election Campaign Act Amendments of 1974, which aimed to strengthen and expand campaign finance restrictions that were already in place. One of these amendments set up an independent agency for oversight, the FEC, the Federal Election Commission. But in 1976, the Supreme Court ruled in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision that much campaign spending was protected by the First Amendment right to free speech and struck down some of the spending limits found in the 1974 provisions. Critics of the current system say that a series of loopholes have now been created and that campaigns are awash in special interest money. In particular, they criticize states with extra deep pockets like Steve Forbes. Both the Senate and the House have been trying to resolve the issue of campaign finance reform for years. There seems to be a consensus on only one thought. It's a mess. But is it? At Think Tank, we solve such problems in less than 30 minutes. Toward that end, we turn now to our expert panel. Lady, gentlemen, let me ask a simple question to get started. Uh, starting with you, Lamar Alexander. What is the single biggest problem in our current system of campaign finance? Well, Ben, the biggest problem is the government has tried to restrict free speech and it just can't do it. We've got 23 years of experience with it now. And the result of limiting the ability of some people to raise money to say what they want to say has had this effect. It's made campaigns longer. It's limited the number of candidates. Uh, when they get in, they can't say what they have to say. It's filling up the Congress with millionaires who can spend their own money under the First Amendment. It's increasing cynicism among voters. It's forcing candidates to spend most of their time with people who can give them $1,000. So it's having just the reverse effect of what was intended. It's actually increased the influence of money in politics. And what we need is free speech, individual contributions, and full disclosure. Is that how you see the biggest problem? Well, government can have perverse effects, and certainly aspects of our campaign finance law have, have been harmful, like the fact that we haven't indexed contribution limits to account for the ravages of inflation. But the, the real problem is not that there's too much money in politics or that special interests are calling all the tunes. The problem is what it takes of politicians to raise the money and how those dollars are distributed uh, among candidates and across races. The reality is today, Ben, that laws passed decades ago, as far back as 1907, are now being undermined by the so-called loopholes that you refer you, 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 to, you, and you, that's reduced the credibility of our entire system of campaign finance law. Nancy, you have studied this. Uh, what's the biggest problem right now? The biggest problem is that we have a 
fundamental uh, maladjustment in the way that our campaigns are financed. And so what we've come to today in America is that we really have a two-tiered system. And at the top tier is that thinnest slice of the population that funds our political campaigns. And that is dominated primarily by the top of our economic ladder. And those are the people who choose who are going to be the candidates because those are the ones able to raise the money to fund those candidates. Are, are you talking about a thousand dollars contribution that that's the top of the economic spectrum? Well, those who can give money at that level are in general at the top of the economic spectrum, but also folded into that are the soft money contributions going to the parties, which are amounts of 10,000, 100,000 and up. And the rest of us then are sort of in the second tier and aren't participating in that selection of who our candidates will be, but are left to sort of just vote up or down once we're given the slate that's right, let, otherwise. Let's go through a couple of these things one by one. Uh, the thousand dollar limit, bad idea. Yeah, it's, a ter it's a terrible idea. I mean, let, 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 let's go back to this. This country was founded on the idea of free speech. Remember Thomas Paine? He called King George a French bastard and went on from there. And he pr printed 100,000 copies of his little pamphlet, Common Sense. Now, under the current thinking of some people, why King George would require him to form a political action committee and restrict his contributions and say he could only so, print so, a, so a thousand, do, do a thousand you, of those. So Tom Paine and any other candidate for office in America needs to be free to raise enough money to say what he or she has to say but so voters have choices. So think, limits are bad. So in other words, you just don't want to raise the thousand dollar limit to index it for uh, inflation up to 3,500 or 5,000. You want to say anybody can give any amount to anyone. Ben, you either have to repeal the limits or repeal the First Amendment because I mean, if Mr. Forbes can spend all he wants and Mr. Perot can spend all he wants and if pro-life can spend all they want and pro-choice can, if manufacturers can, the teachers union can, then why can you say that other candidates cannot? The Supreme Court has actually disagreed with Lamar. They said yeah, that contribution. Sounds, that sounds pretty plausible. I mean, uh, why, 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 the, the why can Steve Forbes spend uh, forty million dollars from one pay from one account, his own, and Lamar has got to spend three years, four years, getting it in thousand dollars? It, it, it doesn't sound fair, and that's the oh. perversity of the. The First Amendment, which I value and which the court has interpreted uh, in its Buckley decision to say that there are potentially corrupting effects when funds are given from one person to a candidate running as opposed to an individual dipping into his or her, her own resources and self-financing their own, their own campaign. Yeah, it, would, it, it would seem to me that it's, uh, it, it's better democratic practice to allow somebody to fund another candidate rather than himself. At least it's not a complete ego trip. The candidate at least has one person in but, his corner. But Ben, what concerns me about that is you're ending up with a system in which you're basically asking every candidate to go out and find his or her own sugar daddy. And that can't be better democratic practice than having a system in which all of the people are participating as much as possible in the selection of candidates. We ought to acknowledge self-financed candidates have done very badly in American politics. I mean, they get attention. Al Checky spent 30 million bucks uh, and got creamed. The same is true of most wealthy candidates that have run for the that, House that, and the Senate. That is not true. Some have made the, it. The Senate is filled. With, with, with millionaires, and if you go to New Jersey today, you'll see Governor Whitman stepping down because the campaign committee has recruited a candidate with $300 million do you to believe run. That's an that's anecdote. That's, that's do you one believe, case, Lamar. Do you well, believe, excuse me, how Lamar, many millionaires Lamar, are there in the Senate today? Do you believe that that's why Governor Whitman has decided not to run I think it's Senate? one reason. I, I find that so hard to accept. I mean, here's a woman who must have total name recognition. She doesn't need $12 million to run. She's going to run uh, prob possibly against Governor Florio, who has former Governor Florio. She would need to raise... Incumbent politicians who have all of the advantages of of incumbency and so some of the personal wealth <laughs> counters some of the advantages of incumbency. Mind you, I'd like to make changes to free up challengers, let them raise seed money with much higher contribution limits, counter some of the wealthy candidates. That's all true. But the real problem, Ben, is not there. The real problem is that in 1907 we made a decision to ban corporate treasuries financing federal parties and candidates, and in the 40s we did the same thing with the labor unions. Today we have a system 
where elected officials and party officials are out there coming close to extorting corporate executives and union officials into giving six and seven figure contributions. A real conservative ought to be so appalled by the abuse of state power that he ought to call for a return to the old regime, the pre-1974 regime. I'm a real conservative. I, I, I agree with that. I, I'm for individual contributions. So you're against free speech, full you're disclosure. I'd ban all union contributions, all corporate contributions, if the First Amendment would permit it, which I doubt it does. But if I were king, I'd do that. But the First Amendment, you would acknowledge, under current Supreme Court law, does permit the limiting of contributions. I mean, I think it's important yes. to note yes. that what what uh, Tom has been it, talking of some about. Kind of some contributions. It does, not, it, it does not keep the teachers union or the Right to Life Committee or Steve Forbes or Mr. Perot from contributing to themselves and exercising their free speech. Well, but and it, it doesn't it limits permit and, 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 mine and, or yours if we're candidates. And, and it well, doesn't but, limit but, Microsoft's ability, for example, if instead of giving a hundred million dollars to Lamar Alexander, he could give a hundred million dollars, and Microsoft could give a hundred million dollars in soft money to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, is that right? But what we're saying right. is it would be there are not serious constitutional problems to limiting and closing the soft money loophole. I mean, the Supreme Court in Buckley said you can limit contributions to candidates because there's an inherent corruption in unlimited contributions. Parties and their candidates are so intertwined as they appropriately are in our democracy that the same corruption issues come up when you're talking about party leaders and congressional leaders and the president of the United States raising money for the party that's then used this soft money these days really to just help the candidates get elected. And so, and, and there's not a serious constitutional problem to doing that. And what I'd like to see is that sort of, you know, First Amendment fig leaf be taken away and have the real policy debate, which I realize Lamar is also having, about whether or not you want to let the kind of wealthy interests dominate our system, but not to hide well, behind. He, you know, this is to me an astonishing I, I, discussion because you know here we have the defenders of free speech in America, the free press, the faculties of universities, the thinkers at the think tanks. If somebody were to come in and say, "Let's restrict your the size of your chair." or the amount of your advertising, so you can't say as much, they'd be up in arms. So why should we even be but, thinking but, but about but restricting the ability of candidates we, who are elected to represent we, all of the people from saying what they want to say? We just agreed that, and George W. Bush agrees that corporations and unions should not be able to finance federal parties and candidates from their treasury. Well, should, That's what well, should, most soft money is today. So there's an area well, of agreement. Stuart, was it bad for Stuart Mott to give Eugene McCarthy a million dollars to run against Lyndon Johnson in the Vietnam War? Would you have regulated that? Uh, that is always the best example used, well, it is a and that's, good that's why I'm sort of attracted. <laughs> I'm attracted to the notion, Lamar, that challengers ought to have some freedom yeah. to raise seed money to really get a candidacy going. What I would argue in this current round of politics is that George W. Bush is not where he is today because of uh, all of the money he's raised, but the money he's raised is an indicator of a political party that desperately wants to agree on a candidate who looks to them like a winner in November. And, so and, money isn't and, the and key not only figure, that, but, but, factor here. But he played by the rules and has raised $50 million. He has over 100,000 givers of-, of He has about, nearly 200,000 givers. Yeah, he has 200,000 givers. Now that, that's a pretty big primary in itself. And uh, it's unfortunate from, certainly from your point of view, that you couldn't raise every day on the internet and make it an issue. So, so if Bill and Gates, people if Bill Gates calls me and says, Ben, I'll give you $100 million, and I don't have your scruples, I'd say, hey, send the check. And, and, and Ben, I'd roast you every day. I'd yeah. say, Bill, I'd say no, I would. I'd say, yeah. Ben Weinberg, you've sold out to the big Microsoft interests in this country, I, and you ought not to be president of the United I, States if you're in this pocket. I can't even run Windows. I, I <laughs> haven't sold out to anybody. All right. but, I, but I also think it won't really be the people making the choices in that case, because the cost of admission into such a race, when every person seriously thinking about running for Senate thinks, well, I've got to put together, you know, ten hundred thousand dollar backers or thirty hundred thousand dollar backers. You know, your average candidate that doesn't have access to that kind of uh, money isn't going to be able to get into the race. So although there will be this debate, and you're right about that, Lamar, you can criticize people. That's why disclosure is good about where they're getting their money from. It's still going to keep a lot of good candidates out. 
And that's, and I think the other important thing to, to note about um, this deregulation option is it's not the way when the voters have been given a choice to implement campaign finance reforms on the state level that they've gone. They have always gone in the direction of more regulation, not less. They do want a level playing field. They do want a field where they're going to hear a Lamar Alexander and a but, George but, Bush. But Nancy, the, the problem is this, the, the media discussion is so one-sided on this that it sounds like you fixed the problem when you limit the contributions when in fact you make the problem worse. Let, let, but Lamar, let me, let me you did pretty well words. in last time around in 1996 and in, in raising money and garnering support Let's say we just, we just raise the limits to account for inflation. If, you, if people perceive that you and other candidates like you have something going, offer an alternative, are the party's ticket to success in November, as George W. Bush has demonstrated, you can raise the money you need to fund, uh, to fund the campaign. A lot of this is so theoretical, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense the way the system works is if Elizabeth Dole, let's pick an example, is calling Ben Wattenberg and say, Ben, give me a thousand dollars. Ben might say, look, I just read in the paper, Washington Post says Bush has got it wrapped up. You don't have a chance. Why should I give you a thousand dollars? But if, if Elizabeth or John McCain or I or someone else can raise larger amounts of money, then we're in. Then the newspapers write about us. Then we can raise more money but, and but, the front but, runner but, raises but less. Your, your example, as Tom was trying to point out, is the best answer to that. You, you bucked that system in 1996 and you came within a hair's breadth of winning uh, the New Hampshire primary and had you won that, uh, you would have been off and running. Yeah, but I had, but, but, but and, I spent, and, a, I, and, that, that's, yeah. there's some truth to that. But, but you know what helped me is because the restrictions are so heavy on candidates including the one that, that costs campaigns about 10% of everything it raises to comply with the federal rules, that a lot of my strongest competitors didn't run. Random process where they can directly um, design their own legislation and vote for it. In Maine and Massachusetts and in Arizona, the voters have chosen a clean money system. And what that is, is they've replaced a system which is voluntary. Candidates can decide to join the system, replace the private funding of campaigns with full public funding and candidates who agree to spending limits and then also qualify, they have to collect a certain number of, a threshold number of small contributions. In Maine, for example, I think it's $2,505 contributions to run for governor. Once they've passed that threshold, they've agreed to voluntarily limit their spending, they're then given the public money on which to run their campaigns. They don't have to fundraise after that point, they can go out and talk to the voters. And um, that's what they've chosen in those three states, and it's a very different system that the people they're asking for than what we're debating, which is just contribution limits, no contribution limits. I agree, you need some kind of voluntary spending limits to go along with contribution limits, um, and I think you need some. True or false? <laughs> it, it's partly true, partly false. Some of the same people and interests give to both opposing candidates because they want to make sure they have a sympathetic ear to, be, to hear their case after the election. Is, is that bad, to have a sympathetic ear? Uh, I think it's bad when, when individuals or companies or labor unions uh, undermines the whole notion of competition and of the clash of ideas in a democracy, and it's harmful. But Ben, your broader point was correct. The critics, some critics of campaign finance believe that if their reforms were passed, corruption would pass public policy decisions would change dramatically and we would live in democratic nirvana. It's foolish. You made a point that uh, money in politics is a long way from being everything. People keep quoting Jesse Unruh, money is the mother's milk of politics. In fact, it's ideology, it's personality, it's the ability to campaign, it's your position on the issues. The small slice of the population is funding our campaigns. And that's what Americans want to see change. They may be wrong that it's going to bring about democratic nirvana, but a lot of them think they're living in democratic uh, hell. Let, let's just end this with a brief statement of what you think is going to happen on this front in the next few years. I think voters are going to get tired of the presidential race, at least having fewer choices, long campaigns. Money makes so much difference and so many millionaires running. and. They're going to sit up, and when, when they have a choice between uh, Trump and Beatty and the latest Powerball winner, they're going to say, hey, let's wait a minute. Let's open this up. 
let's have free speech and full disclosure. I think that's the only solution. We either repeal the First Amendment or we repeal the limits. We'll be wrestling with the problems of money and politics for the length of the history of the United States of, uh, of America. The thing that would increase cynicism more than anything else is anything goes. The Lamar Alexander deregulate and disclose system. We need to patch the system where it's broken apart to undermine the legitimacy of the law. And then we got to figure out ways of freeing up money, raise contribution limits, some modest public subsidies, bring small donors back into the game, uh, all the while recognizing that in every democracy in the world, only a small fraction of the citizenry actually have the motivation to contribute. Nancy, what's going to happen? Campaign finance reform is going to prevail over the next few years because common sense is on its side. The American public wants something different. And the First Amendment, which I don't think Madison put in the Constitution to let rich interests well, dominate, Lamar will not Lamar is suggesting stop it. something different. I mean, it isn't just something different. You're saying something different, namely tighter re-regulation. I'm saying something different, namely what the Supreme Court has said is constitutional. Voluntary spending limits, some form of public funding, contribution limits. Okay. Thank you, Tom Mann. Uh, Lamar Alexander and Nancy Northup, and thank you. We encourage feedback from our viewers via email. It's very important to us. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036 or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.